Welcome to another Open Team in-depth webinar. Uh, today we have a presenter, Jim Fruchtemann, founder of Benetech and Tech Matters. Um, and today he's going to help us uh, discover how to fund digital public goods. Um, so as we know, the social goods sector is increasingly funding digital public goods, like openly licensed content, open source software, and shared data sets. And so his presentation is really about that life cycle. Um, and so I'll kick it over to you, Jim, in a moment. Um, this in-depth series is really about building the knowledge base of our community uh, in a way that can foster coherence and collaboration so we can better serve our diverse and growing membership. So Jim, we'll have about 20 minutes of presentation and then we'll have the remainder of the hour um, for Q&A. So thanks again, Jim, for joining us. And thank you, Laura. I'm, I'm delighted to talk about this stuff. And, you know, um, technology is getting to be more and more critical to accomplishing just about anything ambitious in the modern world, whether that's in the social good sector or the business sector. And, um, and one of the challenges is um, if you write your own software, you're the only customer for it, right? And so, uh, and a lot of people have been running into this sort of problem that that doesn't scale. So, most people, when they have a particular need, turn to um, a, a large product, you know, or whether that's Salesforce or an accounting system to actually get the benefits of, of that technology. And then they do a minimum amount of customization, right? You know, so maybe, maybe I take the accounting system and I put in my chart of accounts and I put in the three products that I sell, but, but basically 90%, 98% of the product or more is standard across everything else. And so, so this is the way that most business operates on software, but in the social good sector, we tend to roll our own a lot and that creates a lot of problems. So I think the focus of today is, let's imagine that you have a sector and you have a need. And let's say that the market is gonna fail, that there isn't a for-profit product that's a great fit or it has to be heavily, heavily, heavily hacked. It's like, it's like starting your own, rolling your own. So what, what happens when people care about social mission is they they create a solution to this. And we we're using the label digital public good because we could be talking about, yes, a piece of open source software, um, but we could also be talking about um, a shared data set, uh, a piece of media or content. Um, and these, and people are increasingly licensing these under open licenses because they have a public good objective as opposed to a proprietary or, or private good. So. So what we're going to be talking about, what I'm going to be talking about today is how do you find the money to get those digital public goods? And Laura, it was great that you used Lifecycle to talk about that because that's going to be the main frame of, of my conversation today. So, um, so what I want, to, um, I want to touch on is first my background to this. You know, um, and, and, and basically, I've been creating, um, you know, I now know the term, but digital public goods for more than 30 years. Um, even before I even knew what open source licensing was, I was writing open source software to, to solve problems in the disability field. And, you know, um, you know what, what we ended up doing as a, as a nonprofit was finding out how to be a tech company that primarily accomplished public objectives, social good objectives. And so I'm going to give you the story of my first technology social enterprise so that you can kind of see where we found the money and the idea that there are a lot of different ways to find money. So my first project got started off the ground because um, we had started one of Silicon Valley's early machine learning companies and, um, and raised $25 million to make a machine that could read anything. And there are lots of commercial applications that it ended up routing the mail or uh, scanning you know, tax forms or insurance forms or contracts for lawyers. But the social good application was, uh, was making reading machines for the blind. And our investors um, vetoed a new product. I was the VP of marketing for this for-profit company, vetoed a product to make reading machines for the blind because our best estimate of the market size was a million dollars a year. And they said, gee, we put $25 million in this company because you promised to make us a lot of money. Don't do this social good thing. But when I went to them and I said, well, well, would it be okay if I went ahead, if I left the company and went and did it on myself? Would you, would you give me low cost access to the technology? They were like, sure. We just didn't want to be distracting our for-profit making money, but sure, we'll, we'll sell you the product. And so it was at the time it was a hardware product 
They sold it to me at 75% off of list and they gave me 60 days to pay. So what I was able to do is sell and I made similar deals with Hewlett Packard and other tech companies. What I did is I sold reading machines to the blind where they paid 25% less than list price. I had a dealer who got some of, some of the, the rest of the margin and we got some of the margin and we were able to build a $5 million a year social enterprise that ended up delivering you know, tens of thousands of reading machines to blind people at a lower cost. So, so we accomplished a social good. It was built on top of a, of a private good, a for-profit company, but I was able to get a, essentially inexpensive access to this technology for a market that they had given up on. And, and they, they, this was exclusively funded by these for-profits for five years in two ways. One is giving me a 75% discount off of the product, which is a deep discount for a hardware product, but they still made a little bit of money. <laughs> That's the kind of margins in, in tech. Um, and they gave me 60 days to pay. And I told all my customers they had to pay me up front or use a credit card. And so basically, not only did they create a financial model that enabled me to make a social enterprise that took this technology and applied it to blind people uh, and later dyslexic people and other things, but they also created the working capital necessary to grow my business, where I could take the money on the barrel head, pay my staff, and then pay my, my vendors um, you know, a couple months down the road. So that's just one example of how it's not only about creating a digital public good and solving a problem with technology, it's also coming up with a creative way to finance this. And frankly, I was, even though I was a 501c3 charity doing this, I was unable to raise any money from donors for at least the first five years. Um, so I went to MacArthur and Ford and all those kind of people. And they said, in the 90s, you look too much like a business. We, we're not gonna have done it. And, and so th this was because social enterprise was new. But luckily today is different. People understand why technology is so important and why nonprofits can have revenue models, even if their central product is openly sourced and licensed. And I'll be talking about why, why does that actually come up as we go on. So, so, um, so I want to focus today not on funding short-term projects for, I think a digital public good to actually have any impact has to live a long time. You need to be thinking about five, 10 or 15 years. And this is because, um, you know, notwithstanding kind of the hype, no business I know of builds their business on top of something that was built in a three-day hackathon, right? That's, that's not what people do. People would not pick an accounting package if they knew that the accounting company that made the software was running out of business next month. But yet that is the description of most nonprofit tech things. So what I'm talking about is a long lasting digital public good, something that's going to be there so that the people, whether that's, you know, nonprofits, government agencies, businesses, farmers who are using this or building this into what they do, this technology, that they have some ability to believe that it will be maintained, it will be updated, that their data will be kept safe if they're entrusting their data to someone else, and then it'll be there two, four or five or six years or 10 years from now. So, um, so if, we're, if we're doing this, um, you know, we have to think about life cycle in two ways. We have to think about the life cycle of the interaction of our customer, our user with this technology, because um, you know, it's not about the license fee. Right, it's, it's about what does it cost me to adopt this technology, to use this technology. So we need to be thinking about that life cycle and we need to be thinking about the life cycle of the digital public good itself. So how, how are we going to build and maintain that? And, and these two kinds of life cycles interact. What I'm here to talk about is finding the money. And so I think the best way to segment, to subdivide where to find the money is to talk about the different stages of the life cycle of the creation of this digital public asset. And so, um, so let's imagine, and, and the one other point I wanna make, um, I am not an academic, um, I am not a lawyer. Um, I can say all sorts of things <laughs> where, that are rules of thumb and generalizations. And the one thing I can tell you for sure is that generalizations rule of thumb, you, you can find an exception. So, but as a practitioner, I think that the things that I've learned by the particular path that we've chosen to take 
through funding digital public goods. Uh, I, find, I think these will be useful to you. So let me pick an example. If I tell you that we have submitted 100 cold proposals to fund digital public goods to donors who've never heard of us, who've never talked to us, 99 plus percent of the time, we don't get any money. Now, you could be the 1% that gets the money on the first approach cold to someone, but I'll just tell you, this is fundraising is a statistics game. It's a numbers game, right? And free money has a cost. There is a cost of capital to asking for free money, right? And, and if you spend the same amount of time preparing a grant application for $10,000 that you would spend for $500,000, I'll tell you your expected value of that time investment is a lot better if you're going after 500K. And if you go after funds that have a one in 10 chance of giving you money, that beats hands down the one out of 100 or one out of 1,000. And yes, occasionally you get that $10 million grant application. And even if you have a one in 1,000 you know, chance, you do the expected value of that. All right, it's worth a try. But th you have to actually be thinking about cost of capital when you do this. And I've developed these rules of thumbs through raising um, over $100 million over the last 20 years for digital public goods for 40 different projects. Um, most of which failed, by the way, uh, the great majority of which failed, but I think hopefully you'll find these kind of handy. So I break down the life cycle of a, of a digital public good, digital public asset into five sort of segments. Um, you know, exploration, do we have a clue? Is this something that we need to build? Um, initial development, okay, we've convinced ourselves that we have something that we really should build. How do we fund it before it works? Um, and then you have sort of this moment launch where now suddenly you're actually delivering value. And now there are some new funding opportunities and new revenue opportunities because you could actually potentially charge for this. Even if it's open source, you, know, you could still charge for it, right? Then there's sustainable operation. In the life cycle, this is where the great majority of money is actually needed. Um, you know, you may spend a million dollars getting the launch, but over a 10 year period, you could easily be talking about something that over that time period needs 10, 20, $30 million of funding because you know, even $2 million a year over 10 years is 20 million bucks. So where are you gonna find that 20 million bucks? Um, and then finally, something that I'm not gonna talk a lot about in, in this is exit. If we're talking about digital public assets, they have a lifetime, right? And I can tell you that we're not talking now about maintaining DOS software, right? There is a reason why, that, why DOS programs are dead is because they're far in the past. Even though in the social good sector, we're still using things that are 20 years out of date, but you know, but the things that are 30 years out of date are dead. So, but anyway, we won't go there today. So, um, so um, I'd say that if you go through this arc, the donors and funders in the earliest seg seg sectors, those segments, they're risk tolerant donors. That's a very, very small percentage of donors. Most donors are risk averse. Most donors are really uncomfortable with technology. And so, uh, so, so when you're actually going for donors, you need people who are going to be up for the chance that it might not work. And of course, the entire life cycle of a digital public asset, if it succeeds, is the success of reduction of risk. So that by the time you're in sustainable operation, you're actually able to ta tap money from people who are not interested in technology and are not very risk um, accepting, but you're at a point where you become not a high risk sort of venture. So, um, so, and, um, so, and I'm gonna also look at this from the point of view of a medium-sized organization, a very small, and a small team and an individual. So basically those kind of groups. So, so let's talk about getting started. Now, I, we do a lot of, Tech Matters does a lot of different projects. I can tell you the hardest money I have to find is going to a donor and say, if you give me $100,000, I'll try 10 things. And I think one of them will be amazing, but I can't tell you which one. Um, that sales pitch kind of fails a lot. So, so where does the money for that earliest exploration come from? Well, if you're a medium-sized organization, it comes from core. It comes from unrestricted. It, it comes from the people who believe in your organization enough to give you money without restricting it to something. And frankly, um, if you do spend it on three dumb things, hopefully you only spent $10,000 each on three dumb things, you don't have to go to your donor and explain why you wasted $30,000 of their money on three dumb things. Because you'll say, here's the fourth thing that worked. And of course, that's what all their money went for. At least you want to give them that, that impression. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, the field of digital public goods is dominated by people who start in 
already sure what the field needs. And, and frankly, you know, it's a whole nother talk to talk about why that's not always the best way to approach this. But, but let's hope that you know, in this early phase of exploration that you've actually talked to 20 users, you know, the people who you're expecting to build this digital public good, the community that's going to benefit from it. And let's assume that this isn't something they just think they might like, but something they might really, they might change their behavior. They might bet some of, the, some of their political and financial capital on, their personal time capital on. But so let's assume that you've actually gotten a pretty good idea. And now you have to fund the initial development. Um, well, that early stage is coming from from a size organization core and from a small team or a startup entrepreneur, it's coming from your sweat equity. So I wanna make sure that you know, often you don't get paid for that. And if it's a digital public good, you will never get repaid for that, right? So it's an investment you're making because you believe in this cause. But let's say that now you've got, you've got an idea. You have um, a bunch of user stories that if you, you know, people tell you, if you build something that makes these user stories come true, they will, they will use your digital public asset and it will change this and accomplish this, this, this social good outcome. Um, you have some prototypes that illustrate what you wanna build. Uh, you have a tech roadmap, okay? Now, now you have another sort of thing. So the, the first segment, the initial exploration could have been free, sweat equity, could have been 10, $25,000. For my organization at our stage, it's often $100,000 is what we spend. It's, it's what we spend on the, the Tarasso project that, that some of us on the call have worked on to find out, is there something real? And now there's the next phase, this initial development phase. This could be $100,000, it could be $250,000, it could be a million dollars. We're often, we, I mean, we just raised a million dollars for Tarasso for this initial phase. So that's, that's kind of our target, but you know, we've been doing a lot of this and so we have, and we know how to raise money for this. And I wanna spread that knowledge wider uh, so that's why we're doing this tall. But um, so so who who's going to give you that quarter million, that half million, that million dollars? Um, because it's still a big bet to make, and frankly, the the chances of it failing are still significant, right? You have, I mean, you should be upfront with the donors that there's a better than 50-50 chance that you might spend their their half million or million and not have enough to show for it. But because you are so great and you have such passion and you've talked to the people and you figured it out you will find a way to make it work. So, um, so let me talk about the segment for that initial development. And I'm gonna reel off a bunch of examples and later on we can explore the motivations. But, um, but because it's 2021, there are actually multiple groups of donors who are actually interested in funding this kind of st stage. And first, there's the explicitly tech for good friendly charitable donors. Um, of which I could probably name five right now, but uh, I hope there's 10 somewhere, but I'm not sure where they are. But you know, uh, Schmidt Futures, um, Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google, his new foundation, two years old. The Patrick J. McGovern Foundation, again, about two years old, but it's a billion dollar foundation that no one's heard of and exclusively funds technology for social good, especially in the area of climate change and adaptation. Might be, might be interesting to know. Um, and then of course, Rockefeller Foundation, um, Gates Foundation on a Good Day, Omidyar, um, you know, these are, these are basically groups that are, they get the risk trade-off, they understand technology, they regularly invest in these kinds of projects, and they have a portfolio vision, much like venture capitalists have, which is they might place 10 bets and one of them might be amazing and three or four of them might be really good and five of them might fail, and that's okay. Not, again, typical donor behavior, but, but they're up for that. A second group are tech companies. Um, and again, in the last couple of years, the tech companies have come out of the shadows. And um, there are companies that you have never heard of that have announced a $10 million grant making program for Tech for Good. Um, and, uh, and the smaller or medium sized companies come from a group called the Pledge 1% companies. So starting 10 plus years ago, uh, there was an initiative uh, run out of the Tides Foundation, um, which is the biggest progressive funder in the West Coast. Uh, $400 million a year of grant making. Um, and uh, they, they hosted this where these companies, the founders would make a pledge of 1% of the equity, 1% of the profits, 1% of their employee time, and 1% of their product to social good, right? And so, um, well, some of those companies have gone public. 
some of those companies, that 1% is now hundreds of millions of dollars, even though you've never heard of them. So I'll pick an example, Okta. Um, you know, it's a single sign-on kind of company. They have a $10 million grant program. Twilio is giving away even more money. Box, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of these cloud companies that are giving away this money. And then, of course, you have the behemoths, right? You have uh, Google. Um, Google has given um, my nonprofits more than $3 million in the last six years. Uh, Microsoft, a uh, million dollars. Um, Cisco, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, you know, and, and the numbers are different for different people. So, and again, they're explicitly hit by the mass. There are also a few intermediary plays um, where people are saying, I'm not a very risk-taking donor, but I'm going to give someone a bucket of money and have them run a fund, right? And so, um, so if you're in the environmental space, uh, uh, the Jeff, the Global Environmental Facility, boatloads and boatloads of money, not the ability to actually look at little projects, but um, but you know, there's a chance you could get a $2 million medium-sized thing from the Jeff, from somebody other than the Jeff, because they've given the authority to you know, any one of a handful of groups, whether that's Conservation International or other groups. So, so there are these opportunities. US federal government. Um, I know that this particular group has seen this. I've seen this. Um, I'll, I'll give you a quick example. Um, uh, we got asked by the Department of Education what the biggest technical challenges were in special education. And we said, uh, science and math topics are really difficult for special ed kids. So they created a million dollar a year, five year um, center. Um, we won it, my nonprofit that I founded won it because we brought all our competitors together and said, we'll give at least half the money to you if we win this. Um, and they said, huh, do we wanna be part of this or not? I, th I think we wanna be there around the table deciding where the money goes and having a chance at getting it. So now, Everything that comes out of that center has to be a digital public good, you know, whether that's a, a, a best practices guide, um, a, a, an open database, um, uh, some so open source software, and all the leading groups in the field got together and said, let's work together on this, on the stuff where we don't compete. And frankly, you know, I don't think of the Department of Education as a very risk-taking donor, but, you know, the, 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 you know, senior bureaucrat that oversees this talks about being a venture capitalist. And normally I roll my eyes, but like, frankly, you know, some of these projects are going to turn out to be big, right? So, um, and then we have accelerators, which is another form of incubator. And there is a nonprofit tech for good accelerator called Fast Forward. And every year for the last seven or eight years, they've brought together a dozen tech for good nonprofits, given them some money, given them some capacity building. And then they have a demo day in San Francisco and at Google um, and you know, and they often raise six figures on demo day from donors that want to fund their digital public asset in whatever area it might be. So, um, and then finally, um, then there's the sort of the one-offs, right? Um, a donor who is not tech comfortable, but because they know you or someone they deeply trust has told them that they should fund you, they might step up and do something unusual. This is this is particularly, um, this works easier with the many, many families that are tech comfortable, who care about an issue, but where they don't have a professional staff, you know, they maybe have a, you know, $20 million in a donor advice fund. And if you can convince them to, you know, recommend a grant to you, you're on your way. And for example, um, the Terrasso project, I think got started with a, a $10,000, you know, grant from the dad of some Silicon Valley, you know, billionaire. So, um, or, sent a millionaire. So, um, so, so I know I went a long time in that sort of initial phase, but that's the hardest phase to get to. And I think in our Q&A, we can talk a little bit more about how do you get to these people and, and how, do you find, how do you find that money? Um, so, so now let's imagine that you've raised that money and you've gotten to the point of launch. Well, now there's a new set of funders that become more realistic. Um, Frankly, when you actually have an initial customer who's actually using your product and actually will give you an endorsement, to many donors, that doesn't look like risky tech. That looks like scaling up and replication, a, a pattern that they know and like, right? And so, um, and, uh, and I mean, this is a good time to also talk about revenue models. Um, now, uh, you know, to the greatest extent possible, I developed Floss Software, um, free and Libre open source software. Um, and when we develop content, we release it under a, a Creative Commons license. But um, the modern world 
is mainly moved to cloud services. In other words, many organizations, many people deploy on cloud. And so even if your software is open source, which is, you know, you can have the recipe for this, um, you actually, to benefit from this in practice, especially if you're not a technical group, is you need someone to actually operate servers and be paying Amazon or Google or someone to actually store your data in the cloud. So these are real costs. And so even though the underlying asset is a free and openly licensed thing, someone is paying for the social enterprise service of actually operating that. And that's actually our primary business model. So when we create some Floss software, we're actually doing it so that we will operate this, this cloud service. And yes, we may have some downloadable apps and pieces, but usually there's a backbone that has to be operated and that we'll have, you know, where we have to send Amazon a check for $30,000 every month or something like that. So, so that money has to come from somewhere. And so um, when we start a new enterprise, when we launch it, we usually have five different earned income revenue models beyond the philanthropic and social sort of, you know, donations models and grant models that might fund this. And most of our projects have a goal of, um, of being at least 50% revenue funded. Now, if you have a global ambition and many tech people have global ambitions because there's, I mean, once you do an open source piece of software in English, there's 60 countries that people might use it, and then you use Spanish and you get another big chunk of countries. I mean, um, if you have that kind of global ambitions, um, we, we think in terms of solidarity, right? How do I get the group in Zambia or Botswana to have the same quality tool, the same digital public asset that a US or Canadian or Northern European group has? So what does that mean in terms of money and revenue models? Well, um, there's a lot of them. I mean, there's a book called Free that talks about all the ways you make money off of free from Chris Anderson, um, who wrote, uh, who edited Wired, uh, had a five or 10 year old book. But I mean, there's the freemium model, right? 95% of our users pay zero. And the 5% of the users who pay something are getting something extra, the premium, um, which might be they can have more data. Um, they might get some extra training or capabilities, they, you know, whatever it might be. But the idea is that 95% of your beneficiaries are potentially getting it for free, right? Um, cross subsidization. Um, uh, for many of our products, a developing world NGO um, is our customer, but our, but you know, if it's $250 a seat for for profits in the rich world and $150 a seat for um, nonprofits in the rich world, maybe it's 25 bucks a seat for um, for people in the developing world or for students. Um, that's actually the, Mara the original Marathi um, thing, which is a environmental project management package that we did 15 years ago. Open source, but we still recommend that people contribute if they can. Now, if they don't have any money, it's open source. Use it. It's great. You know, whatever might happen. Um, so, but let's. So, so I, I talked to some about revenue models. I can go on and on about revenue models because um, I think that is a. I think that is a huge piece of how we actually kind of approach this. Um, but um, but let me let me zero in on. Um, on, on the kind of donors and, and segmenting them. So, um, so usually by the time you've launched, um, you've created an issue uh, based platform. It does something. It's in human rights, it's in the environment, it's in ag, it's in um, education, it's in global health, whatever it is. So, so now a bunch of donors who are in that area are now eligible to fund you. Um, and you know, because we're creating digital public goods, we are almost always going to those donors in partnership with part of our user community. And our basic thesis is, um, and I'll, I'll pick an example of a current project we're doing. We're building um, an open source and shared cloud platform for the global child helpline movement. So in many countries, this is like 911 for kids. Um, the US happens to have you know, an 800 number about child abuse, but, but most countries it's like 116 or something like that. Um, we're building this platform. Um, we partnered with the Child Helpline in South Africa and Zambia, and together we went to UNICEF for money. Now, these are our launch customers for a new product, and we got UNICEF to give money because UNICEF issued a, um, a thing that said they actually were interested in funding technology. I mean, it's probably the first time it's happened in a few, you know, quite ever. But, um, and so now there are launch customers. Of the $750,000 we're getting from UNICEF, $100,000 each is going to um, our two partners. Um, so they're getting $50,000 a year. Um, which in the United States is not a lot of money, but when your annual budget is $400,000 a year, it represents more than 10% of your budget, it's a big boost, right? And uh, the bulk of the rest of the money, this 550 that we're getting over two years, 
The bulk of that is paying for the core development of the digital public asset. And then maybe uh, 20 or 20% 20 of it is doing the specific thing that UNICEF wanted us to work on, which was fighting online child sexual exploitation. So, you know, we went and got a grant. We jointly funded our partners who agreed that they're going to actually take it to scale in their countries. The bulk of the money pays for the development of the core asset that could now go to 20 or 30 countries over the next few years. Uh, but we also did the thing that the grant maker wanted. Now I went a little deep on that one. So um, I think that, uh, that that's basically the kind of material that I kind of prepared. Um, so now I'm happy to answer questions uh, and go deeper into the parts that, that I think you guys might wanna hear more about. Great, well, well, folks are uh, gathering their questions and thoughts. Jim, uh, we have some standard questions uh, to sort of ground this within the open team community. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to just hear from your perspective, you know, again, how you see uh, collaboration on this topic and, and others. And, you know, we're, we're certainly building some of these shared digital assets uh, in the ag space. And just how you see that fits in with your, your the portfolio effect mm -hmm. and reducing some of the risk and so forth. So I'd love to hear you talk a little bit from Tech Matters how you're thinking about the uh, the open team ecosystem as we're trying to reduce some of the risk and accelerate efforts. Okay, so let's let's tackle this in different chunks, right? Starting with the most general, um, we have a mission of seeing that technology benefit all of humanity, not just the richest five percent, right? So we have a mission as a nonprofit to help any other organization that is doing something smart with technology in terms of social impact, right? We have a particular focus on nonprofit projects um, because our kind of feeling is if you're gonna make a lot of money as a for-profit, you're probably taken care of. Um, so we have a karmic consulting sort of engagement where um, a lot of our job is talking people out of bad tech ideas because frankly, the quality of advice in the nonprofit sector, social good sector is terrible. So no, you don't need a blockchain, at least not as your first database. Um, you know, no uh, downloadable app, 95% uh, of the time they don't work. What, do you really have an app use case? Um, so, so I think that that's something that's sort of generally available um, to anyone who's doing smart things with tech. And so, and so I think part of our community is just sharing our experience. Um, you know, uh, when I see something that I go, a donor would like that, I make, I make that blind introduction to that donor and say, I spotted something I think you'll like, because frankly, um, we have a, uh, we call it the, the golden rule on steroids, but basically our goal is to do 10 times more good for other people in our field than they could possibly do for us. And guess what? A lot of great things happen to us because we're engaging in that active thing. So that's, that's a general frame. Um, when we talk about partner organizations, I gave you the example of how we work with a, a less resourced organization. Right, And so our approach to less resource organization is how do we find you the money? How can we become a, a partner in finding money for your project? And so, um, and you know, I don't know if Steve's mentioned, but you know, we've made sub grants to, um, I don't know, you know uh, an indigenous mapping project that I think might actually be worth, you know, looking at from a farmer and local community effort, right? Um, we are also partnering with uh, Mapeo, Digital Democracy. Um, which is an even better uh, locally oriented data collection. I think they have a very clever solution for keeping the data in the community rather than outside. And, but frankly, they're about the same size we are. So we're talking about how do we use each of the money we've both gotten from a govern to work together so we can go back to our donor in tandem and go, smile, we work together, give us more money. Um, and uh, so I think, I think that Dorn, you know, in the question of open team is, you know, because we're trying to create an ecosystem and I think Open Team is also an ecosystem player, um, and we have overlapping ecosystem sort of dreams. You know, our job is don't reinvent the wheel. How to connect these things? Um, we're talking about hosting local data commons under the control of local communities. You know, it, it, could that show up? Um, I know we're talking about internationalization, something we do from the get-go, but maybe it's coming a little bit later. But we have tons of experience about it because almost all of our products end up you know, with UIs in 10 languages and supporting 50 languages in terms of the, the ability to capture and search and all those kinds of things. So um, so I think that, you know, I think it's one of the reasons we've signed on as a partner or whatever the, the structure is, we're looking for that. Um, 
you know, I think that, um, you know, my impression is, is that, you know, these are more peer groups engaging that, because I think, you know, in round terms, we're we're both better at these things than many of the people we're working with. So it's more about how do we channel this? How do we create these assets? How do we see them have the maximum impact? Which is part of you know the goal of creating digital public goods is scale beyond the single organization, the single user, but instead contribute to a very rich ecosystem where ideally millions of people are benefiting from this. Um, and certainly thousands of organizations or businesses are in our, our agencies are dealing with this. Super helpful, Jim. I always have tons of questions, but I really want to make sure that the, the rest of the attendees have a chance to uh, to dive in here. So, I'm... I think Steve is chatting some of the resources. I don't think those are questions, are they? No, not yet. All right, Doran, what's another one of your canned questions while people come up with the next one? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I mean I'm particularly, well, I, I guess maybe I'd love to go in a little bit more into the portfolio approach that you mentioned with a number of the, especially during this discovery process. Mm -hmm. um, and I also, uh, what you're discussing in terms of that transition from discovery into sort of the implementation feels like we're constantly in that back and forth phase uh, and there's a lot of risk. And that's part of, I think, the reason for, I mean, uh, for a portfolio is, and even the accelerators that you mentioned is to sort of reduce some of that non-strategic uh, expense and risk. And so I, I guess I would love to sort of, you know, hear some of your thoughts in terms of how we communicate some of that and uh, how, and um some uh, or maybe some examples uh, from your own uh, portfolio or work to to move towards. So, you know, we've been talking a lot about sort of utilities as sort of that it's part of portfolio, but it's also some of these are almost like utilities. So these software stacks that we can all use to get to the the key piece that's really important, that's nuanced and and important that supports the very specific user story that we're trying to adapt and uh, you know. So I'll, I'll pause there because I could keep going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, so I think implicit in this is how do we communicate with the people with money to get them to support the things that benefit the people, the community that we actually want to serve, right? I mean, I think underlying your question, Dorian, is like how do we make the case for some of these things? And so what I'm I'm always doing, and and you know, I mean, I'm an engineer, and basically, you know, I grew up as an introvert. And I was forced <laughs> by leading these organizations to sort of like become an extrovert because that's what's necessary to run, you know, to, to run an operation like this and find the money, right? And and so, you know, I resisted the fundraising advice and said, you know, you have to get into a relationship. You have to actually listen to what the donor says. But a lot of my job is to reframe what we do in terms that the donor actually understands, right? So in the tech for good space, since many of the donors especially, you know, come out of tech, you know, I'm using venture capital analogies, right? Um, and say, you know, hey, let me tell you, um, don't don't think about this tech done badly, because often when, you know, someone looks at it and says, my God, if that succeeds, it'll be $2 million business. That's terrible. I'm like, no, wait a minute. A break even $2 million a year venture in the nonprofit sector is one of the biggest successes you can imagine. Just, just think of this as not tech done badly, think of this as philanthropy done amazingly well, you know? What if we generate 80% of our uh, of our budget in revenue? That means every dollar you give us punches five times its normal weight. And, and that is, so a lot of this is talking the language of, of, the, of the donor to say, yeah, this is like venture capital, but it's all about social good. And oh, because it's all about social good, actually you should have higher expectations because um, for, for things that actually matter because this is a sparse field. And so, so when we go to people and people say, well, why is your success rate so high? It's because, because I rarely have competition, right? When, when I go into a field where the market's going to fail, it's not like I'm elbowing aside 10 different groups. So I have to make a different case to more traditional philanthropists, right? Risk averse, right? So, so I say, well, you guys invest in capacity building and, you know, and so, and this is capacity building that is three times better than any other capacity building you've ever done, right? I mean, if I if I can tell you that this grant is going to benefit half of your, you know, grant making portfolio, 
um, because we're making this tool available to everybody. And I can get three of your shining portfolio members to come up and testify why this is so important. Um, it's easier to make that case that I'm actually not making a portfolio case to your donor for I'm part of a portfolio. I'm making a case for why what I'm going to do as a, as a single point solution to this field is going to help their portfolio of grantees, right? So I make a capacity building argument. Um, if the donor is someone who claims they care about impact, I say, well, you care a lot about impact. Don't you want to invest in the data and software infrastructure so that your grantees will know whether they had impact? And, 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 you know, and the number of donors who nod and say yes and then go fund the tech infrastructure or the data to collect the impact are legion, right? But it gets through to a few of them. So, so a lot of what I'm trying to do is how do these people value? What, what are they trying to accomplish with their money? Um, and reframe the digital public good that we're doing. And so, and the, the ones that in that earlier stage, the Schmitz and McGoverns and the Rockefellers, you know, they're much more likely to understand invest in a tech for good portfolio or, you know, the rare, you know, senior, uh, you, know, uh, you know, bureau head in a government agency who realizes that their entire field is falling behind and they get to spend 2% of their budget on, on innovation and come up with an innovation thing that actually does do some innovation. Oh, Jeff, looks like you've got your hand up and you're muted, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Jim. This is fascinating. It's the second time I've, I've, I've heard you speak and I can't remember when the first time was, but, but this, is, uh, this is great. Um, and um, I just wanna pivot a little bit. So when you're investing in a public good, you have the investors who are giving the money and taking a risk, but you also have the employees and people that are hired in to do the work. And I guess I've been thinking a lot recently about, um, and in a lot of cases, those folks are taking a much bigger risk mm -hmm. than the investor. The investor's got $100 million, they're gonna spend it. Um, yeah, they'd like to see a return, but you know, they're still gonna have money for Starbucks coffee at the end of the day. Um, or whatever it is, or, or rent, you know, in, in that case. And so, and given the fact that when we're talking about public good, and I've been thinking a lot more about this, I happen to be federally funded. Um, and so my salary is also guaranteed, but I'm basically trying to convince people that they should, you know, take a risk and, and work on a project where my commitment to them is not that I'm going to try to grow a company and give them long-term employment and stock dividends and, and, and so forth. My commitment is to create public good. And sometimes that means that we actually need to have them create something that will put themselves out of a job or we need to you know, create a product that then get news to somebody else. And when you think in terms of the public good, it's a very different model. And I guess I, I, I've really been struggling with this a lot recently and we're about to do a, a, another hire um, that you know will have some level of security because it's, it's, it's hired within a larger organization. We're actually going to hire them on the federal side. I often hire through universities and through nonprofits and so forth. Um, but it's still, I'm going to have to have this conversation again. And, and I'm just wondering, how do you approach these conversations with, with people that you're hiring? Oh, you're, you're um, basically saying, <laughs> so these are, these are very real issues. And um, and you know we have this. Uh, the tech industry has this sort of uh, reputation of being like single-mindedly focused on making money, and it is the norm, right? And the great thing is, I don't have to change 99% of Silicon Valley. I only have to reach the 0.0001% of the people in Silicon Valley who want something other than just to make maximum money, and and often that's also a point in their life cycle, right? You know, if you come out of school with $300,000 in debt, do you want to join a risky nonprofit startup? Probably not, right? You know, and, and so, but, um, but, you know, I often, I mean, I find people at every stage of their career from fresh out of school to mid-career to late career who choose to come work for a nonprofit, who choose to take a, uh, certainly at the senior levels, uh, 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 you know, drop their salary by a factor of three, Right, and I can make that case not because I'm trying to change everyone's mind, but because I'm looking for the people who have the skills that I need, and who are who are interested 
in social good. But um, so, but the, so, what are some of the techniques? Um, you know, my first interview, I want to know: does, Has this person ever demonstrated a heart before? Um, you know, if there's if they never volunteered for kids soccer ever, you know, I'm guessing that they're probably not going to be a mission fit for us. Where the payoff is, yeah, a salary and not a bad salary, and you know, and benefits and pretty good benefits. But you know, but where, um, but where, yeah, they're not going to get rich, and people people will actually sign up for that. Um, but I mean, I often talk about the salary in the first conversation, because if someone is looking for two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, which is, by the way, the average salary at Facebook, um, you know, uh, and that's not what we're paying, I want to make sure we establish that right up front. Um, we, I mean, we have the benefit of being effectively part of a medium-sized NGO, right? Fifteen million dollars a year, eighty people, right? And so, and you know, project money comes and goes. We have something of a portfolio effect so that, you know, if you're, you know, that, that hopefully we will find another gig for you if money for this runs out. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. But the, the, the bargain is you get to work on something important. You get to make a living, not get rich. And, you know, especially people who've been in Silicon Valley a long time, you know, they've been promised to get rich three times in a row and never gotten it and they killed themselves, right? They, they work 70 hours a week and they never got rich. And, and they went, wait a minute, my kids are growing up and you know, I've never taken them skiing or whatever it is. We often make a bargain that, hey, you can work on social good and you can work 50 hours a week. You know, We don't expect you to work 70 hours a week. So I know I'm throwing out a lot of things on, on the table, um, but um, uh, you know, hopefully we're creating an environment where, um, where we expose you to the social impact of your work as part of your work. And when we fail to do that, we often lose people, right? Because because that's why they're making a sacrifice is because they want to make a difference. Even if they're accounting people, we want them to know here's the here's the disabled kid that we do. And of course, you know, we need the same stories for our internal team that we need for our donors to convince them that they made a good a good investment in giving us a grant or a donation. Well, Jeff, I'm really intrigued with the, that that. Uh framing too as we think about the as this and Jim you mentioned the portfolio effect and we've been talking a lot about the ecosystem and I, I think there's some strength in that in terms of building the community and we're even starting to sh share uh, sort of skill sets across this larger ecosystem so that there's more even within individual projects I, I think we have an opportunity here to sort of uh, provide some more stability in the space that we're working in and uh, and I think that that ties back to something that you said, Jim, to be successful, we're going to have to provide some of this durability to the technology and the community to provide the assurance that this is not only going to be around for the investors, but as you say, Jeff, the folks that need to be in it, that this is going to be around for 10, 15 years, 20 years, because we're going to rely, you know, government programs are going to rely on it. Marketplaces are going to rely on it. And all of that has to, we have to trust that this is going to be there if any of those things that we want to say exist are going to, in fact, exist, right? So I think there's a there's a lot sort of in terms of building that durable structure. So my question is coming back, Jim, is I don't know if you have some examples. We've been discussing sort of where that we, we're right in the middle of this public-private sort of line, and we're seeing some real opportunities of of in that some strength in terms of durability of structures from the government side, but perhaps some more flexibility in something that's just outside. And we're always, I, I feel like as a community, we're, we're straddling that a lot. And so I'd love to hear if you have some ideas or some examples where you've seen that sort of that durable structure succeed and sort of carry on so that some of the more creative, innovative things can build on top of it. Well, I mean, I mean, the uh, you know, we 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 create a structure where we you know are trying to, um, where I mean, when I hire someone for a job, the idea is that there's at least a year of money associated with it, right? If there isn't a year of money, I'm going to hire someone on a consulting contract, right? And and be upfront. Now, of course, there's some people who you know whose consulting contract ended up getting renewed five years in a row uh, because we kept finding the money that we didn't think, and uh, and our HR people say you know, you have to convert that person to an employee because legally they actually are an employee. And we've, we, you know, we've done some of that. But I think the, um, I mean, I think having the enterprise 
framework in mind, having the long lasting digital public good in mind makes you think like you're building a culture, right? Um, you know, especially, especially if your organization grows past, you know, 10 or 20 people. Um, you, you, many of the things you do, whether you're creating a successful nonprofit or, uh, or, or a really successful research program as a, as a research professor at university, right? There's, there's a culture of a lab, right? And you, and you have to, th the more you, if you think about that, the more likely that your team is going to punch above weight. I think, I think another thing that I wanna work in, I know there's a lot of questions around this, is, um, is the career path here is not come work here forever, right? That's, the, I mean, that's not really, so what we want people to do is to feel like that in the tech for good ecosystem is a part of the career path of a technology professional, whether that person is a designer or a marketing person or a business development person or a software developer, right? And so, so one of the things that we do is, um, you know, we, we're taking that longer term about how are we building the career of the people who join us and being deliberate about that. And so, and if their dream is to go on to a graduate program, you know, as a young person, you know, we're busy going to be writing recommendations so they can go to, you know, and, and get an MBA in social good or, or in public health or wh whatever the thing is that actually motivates them. Um, we, um, we recruit from big tech companies and we have people leaving us and going to big tech companies. 20 years ago, coming to the nonprofit sector was a one-way ticket out of tech, right? You know, it was like people going and becoming a school teacher, right? You know, all right, your career is over. Um, that's not the way the world works. And, um, and there's active work in the tech field to counterbalance the unbalanced nature of the tech field that has been demonstrated by some of the nasty impacts of the social, of the, of the tech sector on society that, that we're living through right now. Um, where we're using the models from, um, from health and, and the law and say, can we have a more active pro bono culture? Can we think that if you clerk for a judge, which is you know, a major judge, that's a major endorsement as a lawyer. How do we make spending two years uh, working for a social enterprise you know, a giant badge of honor that makes you more interesting? So I know I focused on the human capital side of this, but it's essential to our success because you know even though the, um, the the way these fields are structured, they tend to lionize the entrepreneur, right? Um, that's I mean, and and, and frankly, I, I've benefited from that, right? I've benefited from the networks I have, from the education I've had, you know, the privilege I've had, um, and uh, and so a lot of a lot of what we're focusing on is how do we how do we bring other communities along the, the young class of social entrepreneurs who are far more diverse than I am. Uh, how do we help them be really successful? And um, and because frankly, since our mission is social, there is more than a thousand times more demand for what we do than we can possibly fill. So we want to build this capacity in the larger area, whether that's convincing donors to be smarter about this or convincing foundation, you know, foundations, but also convincing tech companies that they should be more generous with how they make available their, their intellectual property. Um, so we're doing all of these things simultaneously to try to grow this into a viable field that people can either make an entire career out of, but also work here for five years and then go work for Google and make a boatload of money when they're gonna put their kids through college, you know, which is the career path of some of the people who have worked for me in the past, right? So I, I put something in chat, Jim. Are there any other than um, the ones that were listed for where you post any any particular places? Yeah. So you know, Steve has been putting some resources in there, and um, and you know, and we, I mean, you know, we we post in a lot of places um, for for em, basically for employees. Um, uh, we um, especially for less senior positions, uh, we do a lot of outsourcing. So for example, our current tech team is mainly based in South America, right? And how did I find this Argentinian firm? Uh, the International Rescue Committee told me that they were using this firm for their uh, Twilio-based telecom solution. And we were building a Twilio-based you know, telecom solution. So we hired that group. And you know, we, we've also used um, TopTal, 
which is a very expensive place to find talent. Um, but you get very high quality talent, but it's going to cost you 80 to hundred dollars an hour rather than maybe $40 an hour, which is what you would pay in Latin America or, uh, or Eastern Europe. Um, right now we're recruiting in South Africa um, for, for a particular staffer. And there are South African job platforms that we're using. Uh, we're using OfferZen right now. Um, so, I mean, I mean, we, I mean, quite frankly, people can't afford to work for us and live in the San Francisco Bay Area very easily, right? Um, and so, so over the years, we have pivoted to where now the majority of our team is virtual so that, you know, and, and frankly, if I pay someone 70 bucks an hour and they live in Madison, Wisconsin, that's a great living in Madison, Wisconsin, or, you know, or 40 bucks an hour in Brazil, you know, that's, you know, so, so again, you know, and we're, you know, we don't have the money to pay everyone the same rate, no matter where they are in the world. Um, but we, we do intend that our people not be worrying about where they're paying for their health care and not killing themselves, but instead having some time for their kids um, and being able to work on social impact. But yeah, I mean, I posted the Skull Foundation. We posted Fast Forward. Um, Steve, I know we've just posted, um, we have a senior tech job and we posted on um, a, a tech for good platform that I'd never run into before. ICT4D, yeah. maybe. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and then, of course, um, uh, you know, we happen to be in the Bay Area. And so the likelihood that I'm going to have a steady stream of Santa Clara, Stanford, Berkeley, Cal State X, you know, people who are, who are going to be connected with us, you know, we, we, we'll use those networks. Half the time when we hire someone, they come through a network of, of ours. So. Well, I want to thank you so much, Jim, for your time today. This has been a really stimulating conversation. Uh, and I wanted to mention, and, and we're also sharing your job postings through the Open Team Network as well. Thank you. Much appreciated. So, um, so th thank you all for joining us uh, today. Uh, we hope you'll join us for the upcoming uh, in-depths as well and continue this, uh, this exploration that we're all in it together. Great. All right. Thanks. <laughs> Have a great afternoon. Everybody. Looking forward to talking more. Yep. Thanks, Bye. Jim. Thank you all. Okay. Bye-bye. Cheers.